I just want to begin by taking a look at some scriptures, but before I do, uh, let me just tell you how I kind of came to some of these uh, uh, concepts or thoughts at least. You know, back during the days of the first beginning when uh, COVID began to hit, and uh, you know, we were, you know, it was, I hadn't really been listening to the news much and really didn't know what was really happening until uh, literally I was on my way to a conference in South Carolina and pastor called me, said, what are we gonna do? I said, what do you mean, what are we gonna do? He said, man, they're talking about shutting the churches down. I said, I ain't gonna shut the church down, you know? And I said, I'm just gonna put blood on the doorpost of the house and I'm going to church, man. And so we went there and, and uh, did that conference on the way back. I contacted COVID the very first part of that thing hit, you know, and I, I got home and come to find out I had COVID. I'd never even heard of COVID before, but anyway, I came through it really, uh, I think remarkably well, and kind of was almost thankful I got it first because at least I had an immunity and could continue to travel. But even in the midst of that, when things began to shut down, you know, we were shut down for a little season and for several weeks we were shut down. When we finally reopened, my pastor, I don't know if you've uh, got to hear my pastor. I don't know that she's ever been here probably, but my sister is a senior pastor where I travel. She's younger than I am, but she's the senior pastor. And she got up one Sunday morning and she took a text from the book of Nehemiah that I'm going to take here in just a moment. But she made a few simple statements. And when she did, it, something just exploded in my spirit where I thought God was saying that was relevant to the season that we are in. How many know it's really good to hear from God whenever something's going on. And uh, you know, the, the, what, what the first remark she made was, she, she turned to the book of Nehemiah. We're gonna turn there actually, if you want to go ahead and turn to chapter two. Uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, she, she made the, uh, the, the comment that Ezra's name means, uh, I believe it is my helper, and Nehemiah's name means the comforter. And the moment she said that, uh, you know, how many know that the comforter is the Holy Spirit? How many know the helper is the Holy Spirit? And the moment she said that, it was almost like something just went off in my spirit that began to give me a uh, inspiration that I ended up probably filming almost, I think it was probably somewhere around 70 or 80 TV programs on what I call Roadmap to Reformation. Because what happened is that Ezra and Nehemiah are, are to me pictures of the Holy Spirit that moves in the midst of chaos. And I, I, I got this from Charles Simpson in a conversation one night while we were uh, at my conference and we were right before my conference started. Uh, Charles made a, a passing statement. He said, chaos is the end of what's not working anymore, but it's also the birthplace of change. And when I begin to see that, I, I really begin to, to hear the Lord say to me, that in the midst of the chaos that's happening right now in our planet, not just back then, but now, how many of God moves sometimes in the midst of chaos and the uh, Ezra and Nehemiah to me are pictures of what the Holy Spirit does sometimes in the midst of chaos to bring about change and reformation. How many know God, how many know sometimes a move of the Spirit is not always people laying all over the floor and talking in tongues. Now, I'm certainly not against that, but how many know sometimes we don't really grasp the gravity of sometimes how the Holy Spirit can move or hover over some of the chaos we're in? Probably many of us came to God in the midst of chaos because what was, come on, what we were in was not working anymore. Anybody can say amen to that? But how many know God seems to hover over that? And when I thought about that, I thought, well, what would be a scripture or a text you know, that would give me that kind of uh, a launching pad to say that from. And the Lord said, well, look at Genesis chapter one. I know we usually try to start the gospel with Genesis chapter three, but really begins in chapter one. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the great deep. How many know that chaos ruled the face of the great deep? But the scripture says, but the spirit of God moved. How many know God moves in the midst of chaos? I don't know, that the implication there is like a chicken that would sit down on an egg and begin to hover over something and brood over it and in the midst of that chaos and in the midst of that darkness, God begins to speak and say, let there be light. And how many of the once he declares, let there be light and light begins to come into the darkness, 
How many know that the, all of a sudden the earth begins to bring forth? In other words, there are, there are moments when it seems like we are in the midst of chaos or darkness that we don't really necessarily see God moving. Even I could go back and talk about stories in my own life of, of times when I thought sometimes it was the enemy doing things to me and it was really God preparing me in the midst of some things that seemed to be chaos. It was God moving to set me up for where he was put, put, going. To, how, many can, how many can identify with what I'm talking about tonight? You know, I mean, I could, I could tell personal stories about how God began to move over that, that, those, those circumstances and begin to breathe into it until there would begin to be uh, something that would begin to shift. And so as I, as I started to look at this, the Ezra and Nehemiah are both contemporaries. They are working together during a time of captivity when they are leaving the captivity of Babylon. And they have been in Babylon for several hundred years according to the prophecies of Jeremiah. And they've been there. The scripture says the last chapter of the book of Chronicles tells you that they were in captivity until the word of the Lord by the prophet Jeremiah would fulfill until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. Now let me stop and just, just teach just a little bit tonight. Now when I think about that, when I think about the Sabbath, I'm not thinking about which day of the week you worship. How I many know under the old covenant, the Sabbath was a certain day of the week? But in the new covenant, how I many know that Jesus Christ is our Sabbath? He is the rest that we have as a result of his finished work. As a matter of fact, the writer of the book of Colossians says, let no man judge you and respect to meat, drink, new moon, or a Sabbath day. These things are a figure or a shadow. The reality, however, is found in Christ. So when I start to think about how the book of Chronicles and how the book of Ezra and Nehemiah might be relevant to us, I start to look at it and say, well, I think the church is still in a mess today because we don't keep Sabbath. And what I mean by that is not that we didn't go to church on Sunday, but somehow we've missed the revelation of the finished work of Jesus Christ and what he's already accomplished and done for us. And that's, I believe, some of the stuff that God wants to bring reformation to is a revelation of what he's done to bring us into a place of union with him where we can live and move and have our being and flow from a posture and a position of rest because the work has been finished in Christ. I mean, most of our confusions come because we don't understand what Jesus has already done. Hallelujah. Matter of fact, we do more stuff sitting around altars asking God for something he already did or something he told us to do. And how many know the truth of it is, is sometimes the problems even that we have are not necessarily a result of God not doing anything. The question would be not what is God going to do. The question is, what are we going to do? And I believe that what has happened is that the church has been in a place somewhat like that. But all of a sudden, I think with all of the stuff that has happened and the church having been deemed to be, uh, you know, uh, non-essential is because we really have preached a message that was more about how I can get from here to there. And we made the gospel about either, uh, you know, get born again, get your ticket, you're on your way to heaven, but we got 70 or 80 years here to live in misery and we don't really realize that what the gospel of the kingdom is about is not how I can get from here to there, but how I can get what's happening there to operate here. And even when Jesus would teach the kingdom and he announced and John the Baptist announced the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It is within your grasp. Come on, put your hand out a minute tonight. Just put your hand out right there. Your, your hand is right here. What John was announcing over 2,000 years ago is the kingdom of God was within their reach, and if it was within their reach, it certainly is within our reach. But how many know, just like many today, their concept of the kingdom was that Jesus was going to come and lead a revolt against the Romans and overthrow them with military might and power like maybe a, uh, you know, a, a King David on steroids type of thing. But he came to introduce the kingdom as being a different kind of a kingdom. And then he would teach things. And I don't know how we somehow, I don't know how we've got where we've got with our understanding about the kingdom of God and about even concepts we have about heaven See, we're still back in our conversation here. <laughs> yeah. 
is that we, 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 we've read stuff into the text that's not there. Because when Jesus would teach the kingdom, and he would say the kingdom of heaven is like, he was not talking about other world stuff. He was talking about this world stuff. He was talking about things like stewardship and, 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 and sowing good seed and, and uh, transforming people's lives. And if I cast out devils by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. And so all of a sudden, you begin to realize that when he's declaring the kingdom of God is at hand, he's talking about the answers that we need in every generation in the midst of chaos is that heaven has an answer for it. But the answer is not necessarily for us to die and go there so we could be happy, but to bring what's happening there in the realm of spirit into the visible manifestation where it actually is effective to people's lives. I believe the real gospel of the kingdom will give you back your life. Jesus didn't say, see, we read stuff into the text again that's not necessarily there. We, we'll read the text, for instance, straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life. And we read into that text, straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leads to heaven. That's not what it said. Leads to life. And few there be that find it. Broad is the way. Wide is the gate that leads to destruction, and many there be that go in there at. And then you have people say to me, I've had people say to me all the time, uh, pastors do, they'll say, well, well, you know what? When I get my act together, I'm going to come to your church, Pastor Stewart. To which I would reply, if you get your act together, it's just an act. God's not interested in actors. He's interested in authentic life. That he that has the son has life. Not after a while, right now. And he, you get this life, and this life becomes the light that attracts people to the gospel. And so when I started to think, even the, the straight and narrow, they'll say to me, not just uh, I, when I get my act together, I'm going to come to your church, but they'll say, you know, I just need to get back on the straight and narrow. And what that means to them is, I need to get my, uh, my act together, or this performance-based Christianity that says, okay, if I can just, you know, if I can walk in what we think all the rules are, then I'm on the straight and narrow. But the next chapter opens up, and I probably, this is probably a can of worms. I, I'm probably taking too long to get to where I need to tonight. But the next chapter opens up, and he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. And he goes on to say in that same chapter, But I am the door. Actually, uh, uh, Dave, I think it was Dave, right? Beavers was talking to me about my latest book called The Great I Am. And what I did is I took the seven times in the Gospel of John, that Jesus says, I am, and showed how that is a contrast. He, every time he said, I am, it was always in contrast to something from the old covenant. In other words, you thought the way into the sheepfold was through performance Christianity and old covenant concepts and keeping of rules. But that's not the way. I'm the way. Well, thanks for that thunders, amen. I'm the truth. I'm, you thought the shepherds of Israel were the shepherds, but they were the ones that he said were not the shepherds. He said, I'm the good shepherd of the sheep. To me, the porter openeth. He says to them, you think that was the vine. That's not the vine. I'm the true vine. In other words, he would always contrast it to something from the old covenant. So when he's re re declaring this in, in John chapter 10, and he says, but uh, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber, but the sheep did not hear them. But the, the, and then he comes down in verse 10 and says, For the, the thief cometh not but for to kill, to steal, and to destroy. And what we do with that is we, we read into that text something that's not there, and we say the devil came to kill, steal, and to destroy. The devil's never mentioned in John 10. I'll try this side. The thief of John 10 is not the devil. The thief of John 10 is when you think there's some other way into the sheepfold than through the door, which is Jesus. In other words, what, what he's simply saying is if you think performance Christianity and the keeping of the rules, I ask people this, how many, I ask people this a lot of places, how many good works does it take for you to be saved? Does anybody know how many? Five, 10, 15, 20, 100, 200, huh? Zero. How many of you can't do enough good works to get in? How do you get in? You get in through the door. 
Let me ask you something else. How many bad works does it take to get out? Well, I grew up to think it only took one. Well, I'll try that over here. Hallelujah. But if you couldn't do enough good works to earn it, you can't do enough bad works to lose it. Now, I'm not suggesting that you do bad works. I'm suggesting that what he's pointing you to is that there's no other way in and there's no other way to live even a godly life except through the door which is Jesus Christ and then that life becomes the light because all that ever came before me were thieves and robbers and what has happened is we have we have literally I've chased too many rabbits but we have literally uh, lost uh, our joy and our peace by making the gospel about performance and rules and regulations and we mix and, and match old covenant ideas and concepts to try to think you can make it in through that see the straight and narrow the, uh, the other the some other way that was trying to lead them in was through performance based Christianity he's not talking to heathens he's talking to people who've been in religion their whole lives and he's thinking you think that's the way in but here's the deal the end of the law Romans 1 and 2 says there's not run righteous not even one nobody makes it in by the works of the law it has to be by the hearing of faith and by trusting in the one and the moment you do you start to get your life back and I've used the example of my mom was you know uh, she, I'm, I'm chasing too many rabbits here but my mom I can remember growing up you know and, and especially in in the Pentecostal that we grew up in and she would say uh, stuff like she testified she said man I, I saw a saint of God today and then she'd get that little jerk on her, you know, Shundai, you know, a little bit of, y'all, y'all ain't been around Pentecost enough to see that, that jerk, huh? My mom would get that jerk and she said, mm, hallelujah. I knew she was, mm, knew she was a saint, mm, saint of God by the glow on her face. And I'm thinking, mom, that's not a glow. That's a shine from no makeup. And she said, I, she said, this woman, I knew she was a saint because, and I'm thinking, I'm just a kid. And she's saying, what a testimony this woman's life was to the world. She said, I saw her in a grocery store today. Now, let me, let me just say this to you. Mom didn't know her because of the glow. Mom knew her because she was wearing the same kind of clothes, the same kind of outfit, the same kind of beehive or, come on, or top knot, the same kind of what we called holiness outfit, because we thought holy was what you wear or how you looked. And so mom said, I knew she was a saint. She didn't know her because she had a glow on her face. She knew her because she was dressed in the same dress code that we were in. And my mom said, what a testimony this woman's life was to the world. Except the people in the grocery store are not saying, what a testimony that is. They're thinking, you mean your God makes you look like that? And their thought is, I don't think I want Jesus until I'm 85 and got three more breaths left. Because it takes you, come on, it takes your life, it takes your peace, it takes your joy, because that's the some other way that we thought was the way into the sheepfold, except that became a thief to life. But see, the straight and the narrow was not performance. It was learning to turn and put the realize, realize that the only straight and narrow there is is Jesus. He's the only way in. I gotta trust him. I gotta put my confidence in him. I gotta believe in him, not only to save me way back then, but every single day of my life to give me the quality of life. That, and all of a sudden, when you start to realize that the gospel is not just about performance and rules, it's about a relationship with Jesus, you start to have a life where he starts to put back together your marriage, your joy, your peace, and then people say, I want a life like that, and that's when the life becomes the light. That's the kind of life people are looking for. They're not looking for one that robs them of everything here, and then after you die, you can go there and get it. What it's looking for is somebody that realized Jesus brought us something that gives us righteousness, peace, and joy right now, and it's in the Holy Ghost. And if you say, well, what is that? That's, that's what we define as the kingdom of God. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy, and it's located in the Holy Ghost. And so I think that what happens is, is that there's a massive shift going on, and the Holy Spirit is even brooding over the mess and the chaos that's in the church to begin to bring about reformation. And I think it's incredible. I'm going to be all of, I'm just going to give you a brush stroke tonight of, of, of a whole lot of stuff that I have in Reformation. 
And then all of a sudden, God begins to raise up leaders like Ezra and Nehemiah. And Ezra was more famous for restoring the temple while Nehemiah rebuilt the city. How many know everybody has a different function in what they're supposed to do? Everybody has a different assignment. I've got so here in the last several years of my ministry, I realized, hey, I've got a certain assignment. And all I can be is what I was assigned to do. All Stuart Farley can do is be what he was assigned to be. And when we get comfortable in our assignment and start to function, realize, oh, wait a minute, I, I don't have a pastoral bone in my body, but I need pastors in my life. Come on, somebody. I, I'm always amazed even at times when I have uh, different, you know, like my, 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 my pastor or my son on my TV program. And even while we were going through this Reformation series and my sister was teaching on it, I was teaching on, again, my sister's my pastor. And uh, so I would have her on the TV program. And it was, it was, to me, it was, it was amazing to me that she would see it through a pastoral thing and how this can practically, you know, affect people's lives. I'm seeing it from this prophetic apostolic viewpoint of here's what God's saying, here's what God's doing. And she takes that and goes, here's how we implement it. Teachers will grab it and say, hey, here's, here's the steps to achieve that. How many glad for the different kind of functions? And then you get so, you get comfortable in your calling and think, you know what? I admire, I used to sit and hear other people preach and teach. I think, God, I wish I could preach like that. And find out they're sitting back there going, think, I wish I could preach like that. So we just got, so you got to get comfortable in whatever your assignment is because every one of us in this room, not just pastors, but people have an assignment in the earth to do something in the earth that is uniquely what you're called to be. And I, I probably, I don't know if you've shared this or not, you know, but I said this up at the conference. See, holy, I'm getting, I'm just not, I'm all over the spectrum here. Hallelujah. But holy doesn't mean you go in the dark. Holy doesn't mean how you dress. There were, there, were, there were snuff dishes and tongs and pans in the tabernacle of Moses that were consecrated to be holy vessels. Can you imagine a snuff dish as being holy? You know what a snuff dish was? They took the, the ashes from the candlestick, the tongs from the candlestick, and they would take the charred wick and put it in the censer the snuff dish and they would gather the ashes the purpose of that is to show you that god can give you beauty for your ashes but the point i'm after is a snuff dish was called holy do you know why it was in its purpose what makes you holy see is the the word holy means other than or uniquely what you were set aside to be and the angels of god are not standing before the throne of god tonight going he behaves He's wearing the right outfit. When they cry, he's holy, that doesn't mean he's got a certain behavior. That means there's nobody else like or anything like him. He's other than. You know what makes you holy? It's not because you glow in the dark when you jump in the shower, but because you are in the thing that you were set apart to do or consecrated to do. And when you find that place, Hallelujah, you can look at your hands and say, I can lift holy hands without wrath and without doubt because ain't nobody else like me on the planet. Hallelujah, I am who God said I am. I have my part to play in this great, hallelujah, tapestry of bringing the kingdom to the earth, and I'm in my assignment to do that. Hallelujah, chasing too many rabbits here. Hallelujah, but all of these men, Ezra and Nehemiah, were working together. Some were scribes. Ezra was a teacher Nehemiah was a builder. But in the midst of that, you also have these guys like Haggai and Zechariah who are also contemporaries with him. They were working with them. We read the scriptures sometimes and we think, okay, this is clear over here, Ezra and Nehemiah, and then back here towards the back of the Bible or the Old Testament, you've got Haggai and Zechariah, and you don't realize that these guys were actually working together in the same time. So that you had Zechariah and Haggai, who were prophets and priests, who would come and encourage the workers, who would come and speak a word that would lift up the hands of those who were weary in the work. I've got to tell you, man, I was glad. I don't know how you feel about it, but I need to be around people. I mean, I, I, I frankly enjoyed it for a little while when we were all taking a break, didn't realize how tired I was from travel. But I tell you what, after a little while, I get hungry to be around people and didn't realize how much I needed to hear the gospel myself 
even though I know a lot of stuff. I can't tell you how many times I walked into service, Pastor Stu. Knowing the scripture, I know the scripture. I could speak to myself all kinds of scriptures. But my pastor would speak a word that was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and it would be just what I needed to hear to encourage me because I don't care who you are. You're going to need to hear a word from God that encourages you or a word that's fresh from the throne. Hallelujah, that encourages. We need one another. Hallelujah. In the building of this thing. And let me just say this to you is that one of the things that the Lord began to say to me, uh, let, me let me give you some history here. Just a little. I hope I'm not boring you tonight. But the first time when the Lord began to speak to me about this, I've, I've told this story a little bit, but I was in Kansas, uh, actually in the middle of nowhere, Neodoshe, Kansas, only place during that period of time that I had big crowds. Crowds had dropped off everywhere, but I went to Neodoshe, Kansas, Independence, Kansas, middle of nowhere, not even a hotel in the town. And man, there, were, there was hundreds of people came out on a Wednesday night. I thought, you, you know, when you get that many people in the middle of nowhere to show up, they're hungry. But on my way from that meeting to Tulsa to preach in a conference, I heard the Lord say something. He said, I want you to, when you get back to the hotel room tonight, I want you to look up viruses and victories. And I went back to the room and my son was there. He preached the night before me. And I said, pull up on a computer some things. And I want to take a look at some historic stuff. <laughs> and what I found was every time, every single time in history, without exception that there was a pandemic, it was always followed by a massive piece of reformation. And I heard the Lord say to me, you can focus on the virus or you can focus on the victory. And I started looking beyond the, victory, the virus and started looking at the victory. And I started to see some powerful things. Let me just, just I'm going to give you just a brief history of some pandemics and some things that happened uh, during those times. Many times throughout history, this is my notes on it, people have believed that outbreaks of epidemics seem to have a spiritual context that were, were God's divine punishment for sin, or it, in eschatological terms, it was the heralding of events of the end of days. Now stay with me for a moment, because I'm going to show you down through history, every single group thought that what had happened was a last day revival. And when I got to the end of all of this, the Lord said to me, and you can take this or leave it, don't be mad, go home and spit out the grapes or whatever. The Lord said to me, this is not what I'm doing in this hour is not a last day revival. It's a new day reformation. Well, I didn't get much response over there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I think that the shift has to come on our thinking from evacuation and the sky is falling to occupation and what is my role to bring about reformation. Because if you think the ship is going under, all you're going to do is hold on to what you got, but you're not going to polish the brass on a sinking ship. But if you realize that many of the problems that we're having in the planet right now are not because God's not doing anything. It's because the church has lost its focus on its purpose and destiny. And that's to do something in the earth to bring about the kingdom of God and his righteousness in the earth. And I think we ought to, hallelujah, hear some things concerning that. So each one of them thought that it was that. In 430 B.C., here, I'll just give you, just, it won't take me long to go through a few of these notes. In 430 B.C., the Athenian plague hit, causing people to be indifferent to the laws of man and gods, and many cast themselves into self-indulgences. It led to the fall of civic duty and religious super superstitions reigned. The Antonine Plague, also known as the Plague of Galen, hit in 165 to 180 AD, and that plague weakened the military of, Rome, of the Roman Empire and economic supremacy. It also affected ancient Roman traditions, leading to a renewal of spiritual, uh, of spirituality and religion. It created the conditions for spreading the new religion, especially Christianity. The Roman Empire within a few years of the fall of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD had become Christian. The gospel had literally spread until now even the king of Rome was building temples. In the midst of all of that, what happened was 
there was a pandemic that stopped a lot of the military supremacy and began to shift some things. In 541 to 600, the Justinian plague at this point in Christian history, tradition enters into the realm of interpreting and understanding of the events of this nature, drawing on the eschatological, es eschatological narrative of the book of Revelation. Plagues and other misfortunes uh, seen as punishment or sin for retribution or the induction of God's wrath. They were saying this kind of stuff clear back in one, clear back in 500 to 600 AD. God is mad. He's going to kill everybody. The end is near. I, I hope I'm not upsetting you tonight. I'm just trying to get you to think, let's just consider the possibility that maybe somewhere somebody is going to believe God wants to do something in this planet that God wants to bring redemption and see the kingdom of God expand. And to that end, I believe, is what we are called as vessels to distribute the, king, uh, the kingdom of God. In 1334 to 1347, the Black Death hit. The first official report blamed an alignment of three planets for causing great pestilence in the air. Sounds like some recent books I read. <laughs> Y'all ain't going to help me preach tonight. Because they had no explanation for the catastrophe, people turned to religion, began to praying to patron saints, to the Virgin Mary. They began joining in processions of whipping themselves with nails and scourges and chanting hymns and purging themselves by trying to relieve themselves from divine punishment for sins. They tried to identify the groups who were the greatest sinners against God, frequently singling out minorities or women. Jews in Europe are commonly targeted, accused of poisoning the wells and entire communities persecuted and killed non-Catholic Christians and blamed the heretics. In Egypt, they prohibited women from making public appearances so they did not tempt men into sin. So they're going to blame the women for the men's problem. I wish I could get some help tonight. Hallelujah. Don't this see, you know what's amazing to me is these are hundreds of years old and we keep on repeating the same misconceptions over and over and over again. So what we do is we find the group that we think God is mad at, which would be what I'm not. But if I can point my finger at those guys, come on. Oh, help me just preach a little bit. And so that the reason all of this stuff is happening is because these people, and see, it's easy to get so you're, you're pointing and ostracize. It's easy to find somebody else's problem and not, not realize that if you are going to point at someone else's problem, you're going to have to point at yours. Help me, Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. And what happens is, is that all of these kinds of things were, were, were the kind of stuff that, that, that they, they thought clear back then is at some point you'd think it would change. He goes, Jews in Europe were commonly targeted, accused uh, not only, uh, the Jews in Europe are commonly targeted, accused of poisoning the wells and entire communities persecuted and killed non-Catholic Christians and blamed the heretics. In Egypt, they prohibited women from making public appearances so they did not tempt men into sin. They turned all kinds of aromatic vapors and remedies and quacks selling useless cures and adornments claiming magical protection. Sounds like some stuff I saw on Facebook today. Come on, somebody. <laughs> <Everybody's got laughs> the shortage of human labor, though, brought about innovation of labor-saving technology leading to higher productivity. This reformation, reformation also led to the printing press and to the printing of the Bible in the common language of the people. One of the translators of the first Bible that was translated into the common language of the people was burned at the stake for translating the Bible into the common language of the people. Now imagine that. They literally burnt one of the first uh, translators at the stake for giving people a Bible so they could read it for themselves. But in the midst of that particular pandemic, there were some things that began to happen even in the natural realm that affected a culture. In other words, what I'm trying to say to you is that Reformation not only affects a church service, because I think what people are looking for is 
help me, Holy Ghost, is we're on the brink of revival. And I'm, I'm certainly not against revival, but we think a revival is we're trying to rehash the glory days of how it was 50 years ago. But sometimes a move of the Spirit is when God starts to do some stuff to change our culture and to change even things concerning technology. If you could see, even during the days uh, as this one, as this particular pandemic began to came, come to an end and all of these things were beginning to be invented, then all of a sudden that plague resurfaced again in 50 1927, the bubonic plague hit, or the Black Death was having a resurgence. It came first in the 1300s, and then Martin Luther wrote a pamphlet about how we should deal with this in the midst of uh, that, in the midst of that, in the midst of that pandemic. Luther stood up in the middle of a pandemic, the Black Plague, and he stood up and began to preach, "The just will live by faith." He began to lead a reformation. He nailed 93-point theses to the door of the Catholic Church, challenging the common thought of the people. I feel the Lord in this place tonight. And let me tell you something. Sometimes I feel like a fish swimming against the tide because I'm saying some stuff that might literally go against the tide of, of common thought processes that have never been challenged that we don't even know where they came from. And we embrace things, and the moment somebody comes and preaches something out of our paradigm or different, we're like, we're ready to call them a heretic and burn them at the stake. Maybe God is trying to break some revelation into the church to bring about reformation to get us to think different. Because if we don't reform and change, we are going to go by the wayside, ladies and gentlemen. Hallelujah. But if Luther could stand up in the middle of a pandemic and the result of what he stood up and said, he literally hazarded his life. Can I say that? You know, I, I was, I'm going to be just a little bit vulnerable here tonight. You know, Stu and I were talking, you know, today a little bit eating lunch, but, but back a few months ago I was sharing with him how I, I had come to the place in my 40th year of full-time traveling ministry where uh, I'd been on the road 40 years. This, this uh, now, now I've been on the road 43. This is our 12th year of being on national television. It's hard for me to believe we've been on national TV for 12 years now. But in my 40th year, I hit 62, and I was thinking to myself, I don't know if I'm being effective. I feel like I'm swimming against the tide. And I feel like I'm another voice in the pile sometimes. I don't know if you can identify with that or not, but sometimes you don't necessarily, if you're sitting in a TV studio and you're broadcasting, all you see is cameras and whatever's in there, and you don't know who's listening to you. And you're wondering if anybody does because the people who hate you, they have a hair trigger on their writing finger. They're going to write you real quick and straighten you. I can tell when I pick up a letter, this is hate mail. I can just tell by the lettering on it. I don't know what it is, but it's just something about it that this is hate mail. Now, my team filters out a lot of that now. But I was going through a thing. I thought to myself, you know what? I've been on the road 40 years. Maybe it is time for me to retire. Maybe I'm a dinosaur. Maybe it's time for me to retire. Maybe I need to just, you know, kind of go sit on my porch a little while. Feeling discouraged because I felt like I was swimming against the tide and just like, I don't know if I'm affecting anybody. Am I spending all this money? And, you know, is anybody listening? And just to make a long story short, I'm not saying this to be arrogant. Because he's, he may be watching, because he watches sometimes. Just one thing that happened, the Lord spoke to me to go to a meeting in Oklahoma City. And uh, I, the, the bishop of this uh, church is a friend of mine. I've preached in his church before and preached with him other places. And when I went in the door of this church, it was a big, it's a mega church. And uh, when I walked through the door, the guy that was driving for me dropped me off at the door. He was going to park the car. He said, it was fun to watch you walk in the building. He said, all these well-known guys just started coming to me and wanted to get their picture taken with me. And I'm shocked that these guys even knew who I was, yet alone would get their picture taken with me. I went to the bathroom and scheduled three meetings. I told the guy I'm set beside, I think I'm going to go back again and schedule my film my calendar for the year. Hallelujah, I'm going to hang out over here. But anyway, uh, to make a long story short, one of the guys that was preaching one morning, or I guess it was a nighttime, preach, he preached an incredible word. He don't know I'm in the room. There's several thousand people in this building, and I'm just sitting back in because I'm not a guest speaker. And I'm just sitting back in the building beside a pastor friend of mine. I leaned over. I said, this guy's saying something. He said, well, he wants to meet you. He listens to your stuff. And I, he said, you want to go down and, and meet him? He said, I, you know, I know him personally. I'll introduce to you. So I walked down, when I walked down front, of course, everybody's around him trying to get his business card. And they're, you know, just, uh, you know, uh, thanking him for the word. And when he sees me, when I get within 10 feet of him, he pushes everybody out of the way. He starts to weep. He says, dude, before I even shake your hand, man, I got to tell you, you saved my life, saved my ministry, saved my marriage. His wife jumped up. She said, he ain't blowing smoke. He's telling you the truth. He said, dude, I started listening to you seven years ago, 
when you were on the church channel and he said, we used to sit in my office with just me and my closest friends and he said, we would listen and read your material and we would deal it like drugs, contraband, like a secret. In other words, we'd sit in there and think, could the gospel possibly be this good? He said, it began to revolutionize my life and my ministry and just begin. He said, can I take you out to eat? I said, yeah, I'm not a speaker. I can do anything I want to. As long as, you, as, long as the bishop don't care if you go, I, I, I can do anything I want. So he said, let me take you out to eat. So anyway, we got to eat. Make a long story short. Uh, he calls me the next morning. He said, when can you come to Dallas? I said, well, I don't have any Sundays. I had no idea the size of this guy's ministry. I said, I don't have any Sundays left for several months. He said, how about a Wednesday, Thursday? I said, I can come do that. So I go down to this guy's church, man. This guy had seven campuses with about 21,000 people in them. And the Lord said, you're thinking you're not effective. This is just one guy who's affecting this many people and really bringing a gospel reformation and revolution to some things. And so I'm telling you this to say, sometimes you don't think you're being effective, but it, it was almost overwhelming to me because the first, he asked me if I would do what he calls a gospel circle. And when I got ready to do this gospel circle, you had to have a ticket to get in there because it was limited seating. Now you didn't have to pay for the ticket, but you had to have a ticket because it's limited seating, if you can imagine this. And people stood in, in line for hours to get a ticket to hear me speak. And I'm like, dude, <laughs> stand in line to get a ticket to hear me speak. And when he opened the door, they were literally chanting my name. And I looked at him and I said, hey pastor, I said, that's almost embarrassing to me, man. He said, you don't understand brother, these people know where I got this. And they know the transformation that has come in their lives because of the gospel that you preach. And what I'm simply doing is trying to encourage you this morning that sometimes in the midst of reformation, you might be the most hated. And I looked at him and I said, you know what? I've been hated so long that I really don't know how to be celebrated. Because I got to tell you, man, in all the years of preaching and pioneering something, when people wouldn't walk across the road to spit on you, and then they want to get their picture taken with you later on, there's something about that that says... Maybe I'm doing something that matters. Now, I don't know if that matters anything to you or not. I'm just trying to encourage you sometimes because sometimes it doesn't, it's not always in those moments that you're the most successful. It's in settings when you're pouring into sometimes people that you may not think, hallelujah, are really going to affect many people. But when you start pouring it out after many days, it starts to come back on every way. What I'm saying is that, that reformation is not always a massive service where it looks like it's, it's, it's just radical, knock the walls down, you know, Katie barred the door stuff, run the aisle, shout. It is God doing something of a deep work within people that not only is going to bring some change and reformation because sometimes when you stand up and nail the 93 point thesis to the church and you start to make some things that are making people think differently truth makes you mad before it makes you free hello sometimes it challenges what you used to think because I believe we are living in a day when it is not the same old, same old, same old, but God is raising up some people who are going to declare some things. And what happened, started to shift, was all of a sudden this reformation began to affect everything. Not just a church service, it started to affect technology. The printing press was invented. All of a sudden people can read. Art was affected by this reformation where now you don't have to just paint pictures on the, on the, on the ceiling of the, of, 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 the, of the cathedrals. You could paint other paintings. Great music came from this reformation because all of a sudden now music doesn't necessarily have to be limited to bringing in the, the sheaves, hallelujah. All of a sudden, every marriage began to have uh, meaning in the context of faith because Luther, who was a priest, married a nun, and they thought surely out of this union would come the Antichrist. They literally thought that because a priest married a nun and they broke the rules that it would produce the Antichrist. They literally thought that. But what it did was all of a sudden, marriage began to have uh, meaning in the context of faith for the first time. It was like, okay, I can glorify God, not by just being a monk in a monastery, but by being a good husband or a good wife or serving my children. What I'm trying to tell you is reformation can come from your living room. We can change culture and shift what happens in our world by what talk we talk about over our, our dinner tables. 
I know I'm talking, I, I normally don't say this much about what I do, but I can tell you that from the time, you know, Stuart and I have the same kind of family background. We were both raised by good parents who loved Jesus and raised in church. And, 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 and those moments when we were coming up, man, as a poor family sitting on top of a hill, my sister says we were drug babies. I said, what do you mean we were drug babies? She said we was drugged to church on Wednesday, drug on Sunday, drug on Friday night, drug on prayer meeting night. We was, we was drugged to church. Anybody besides me a drug baby? Hallelujah. Somebody drug you to church? Hallelujah. But what was happening was in the midst of those moments when it didn't seem like a whole lot was happening, I learned how to literally preach in home devotions. Learn how to play music and worship. We'd sit when, because my mom didn't drive. And we'd sit, and, let's sit on top of that hill where we live now and think, wouldn't it just be nice if someone would come visit this tribe of kids? It was seven of us at home. And my mom and my dad was working six days a week to try to feed that many kids and what we grew on the farm on top of that. And all these years later, I start to see that People come to that hill now from all over the world to hear the gospel. Stuart's been there during our conference. They come from other countries, come from all over the world. And so what I'm simply saying is that, that reformation can come because we don't think sometimes we're doing something grand and glorious that gets the lights, the action, and the camera. But what we pour into our children can begin to bring reformation. Let me just tell you that what happens, let me read this text at least so I can say, uh, let, me, let me finish these, the history of these pandemics. In 1793, yellow fever hit. It was the first great awakening. Blacks begin to come into the church, in the black Baptist church. Blacks are affected by the Whitmore revival when it hits in 1800. The second great awakening hits and the and method the Methodist Episcopal Church begins to make a stand against slavery in the middle of a pandemic and chaos and racial upheaval God begins to bring a reformation that affects the issues that were happening among the races y'all quiet tonight all of a sudden what was happening in the church began to be the answer not what's happening somewhere else. How I many we could affect change from our own houses? 1832, cholera virus hit, and in 1832, Charles Finney began to preach. It was a great awakening. In 1857, scarlet fever hit, and the Beardsley revival came among strong political upheaval. 1906, 1909, in the middle of a typhoid fever pandemic virus hit William Seymour Charles Parham on Azusa Street. The Sunderland Revival and Smith Wigglesworth began to lead revival. 14 people were raised from the dead during that season, but in 1906, 1909, both Charles Parham and William Seymour, one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast, prophesied without Facebook or a cell phone at the same time declared within 100 years God would bring one of the greatest awakenings we've ever seen. I think we're in the middle of a great awakening. While we may not see it yet, it always starts with a few people. I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. And that's why I'm not moved because there's a remnant here tonight because it never starts with a bunch of people. Matter of fact, when I get to finally read a text here in a minute, we'll see it was never a bunch of people. It was a few men with Nehemiah and Ezra when they first started. But Azusa Street, of what I, I, I'm probably over the place for some of you, but I don't know if you know the history of Pentecost, but our Pentecostal roots are connected to the Azusa Street revivals when the Holy Ghost was poured out on, on people uh, like they'd never seen before. Miracles began to happen. They started speaking in tongues. God began to bring a renewing and a refreshing of the Holy Ghost. And it was started on Azusa Street, watch this, when a black man, a white man, and a woman got together. All of them which were culturally against the grain of the current day because women weren't allowed to vote, blacks and whites didn't mingle with each other, but they got together at Azusa Street and began to pray. And God said, I think that's what heaven looks like right there, and I think I'm going to put my spirit on it. Hallelujah. Can you hear what I'm saying? See, what happens is we are living in a culture that's trying to make an us against them, and as long as there's an us in them, there's going to be fights. 
Somehow we've got to beat our swords and weapons into plowshares and our spears into pruning hooks and begin to realize there, there's something about this reformation that can only be remedied by God's people and not by political powers. It's sometimes a move of the Holy Ghost that does that. And how I many of that probably didn't look like a move of God, what God was doing among the cultures? Are y'all following me? Can you see the different things that happened down through history as a result of reformation that always followed a virus? And then in 1918, the Spanish flu hit. Jack Coe was born. Amy Simple McPherson began to launch revival all over this nation. In 1921, diphtheria hits. Jack Troop and the Fisherman's Revival begins. Thousands of people got saved. In the 1960s and the 1970s, when I got born again, it was an epidemic of swine flu and H1N1, and Billy Graham, Catherine Kuhlman began to emerge, Oral Roberts and A.A. Allen and many others. It was also a great rebellion in our nation and riots of racial upheaval and cities being burnt. My, my uncle was chief of police in Prince George's County during that time. I can remember things about it. Racial upheaval and the protest of the Vietnam War began and God began to move among Jesus people and the hippies in California and Catholics began to get filled with the Holy Ghost. I, I don't know if y'all get happy or not, but I can tell you this. I was born again during this revival when all of a sudden I can remember, I can remember this particular thing. I remember these guys and literally have been in Richard Roberts' house in Tulsa and one of the uh, networks we broadcasted from was GB out of uh, Oral Roberts University. But all the, I, I've been, I stood at the grave of A.A. A. Allen and I, I, I had felt some kind of a, an experience just maybe, I don't mean I, I felt a, a weird ghost spirit, but just what he represented with the miracles. They used to back up, uh, back up uh, you know, uh, ambulances full of people. They would go to the hospital and bring them out on stretchers. They'd come in on stretchers and leave walking out. I've got videos of that kind of stuff where they did that. But in the middle of that, I can remember all of the upheaval and the drug abuse and the, uh, the riots in the street. And I remember all the stuff that was going on. But all of a sudden, God jumped out of the religious box of the church and started filling some hippies with the Holy Ghost in California. Now, religious folk thought God can't give them the Holy Ghost, and then it really got us when he started filling Catholics with the Holy Ghost who were still wearing their earrings, hallelujah, and drinking their wine. You all don't want to help me preach up in here tonight, hallelujah. And God jumped out of our theological box, and Catholics started getting filled with the Holy Ghost. And I remember prophesying, I remember people prophesying against them. Yea, saith the Lord, there are Jezebel in here because they had makeup on or ear bobs or head lovers, we called them. Because we couldn't see past the outward appearance to realize the Holy Ghost is hovering over chaos to bring about reformation, hallelujah. And it was in the middle of a pandemic when all of this was going on that God begins to raise up his church and his people and says, you are the light and the life. If there's going to be any changes, it's not because God's going to raise a magic wand. I heard the Lord say this to me this week. It's from a teaching I did back some time ago in the Hebrews chapter 1. He said, for he did not put the world to come in subjection to angels. The world to come is not heaven. The world to come in the book of Hebrews was the coming age of the new covenant where the kingdom would now be manifest. Because Jesus preached and introduced it, John said it's at hand, and on the day of Pentecost it showed up in power when the Holy Ghost was given and God put the Holy Spirit in the people to begin to be the vehicle to bring about the changes. Hallelujah. And so the, the, as God began to pour out his spirit, I heard the Lord say, he did not put the world to come in subjection to angels. We're sitting around waiting on God to do something, send angels to do it. But the scripture said he put him in subjection to a son. Because he at times past did it through angels and through prophets and God who at sundry times spoke in through by the prophets hath in these last days spoken to us in the son. In other words, everything he had to say, he had to say in the son. He sent the son to demonstrate the kingdom. And as you get to the latter part of Hebrews chapter one, he not only talks about that son, but he talks about us being part of that group of sons that he brings many sons into glory, that he made the captain of our salvation perfect through suffering, but he raises up 
up a company of sons and says, hey, I've never changed my mind about my mandate in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, and that's to give you dominion, to make you my vice regent in the earth, to make you my representative in the earth, and if there's going to be any change, it's going to take place, not because God sends a bunch of angels to do it, but because he sends some sons and daughters of God to do some things. Hallelujah. And I believe he's stirring up some sons everywhere that are not just got my ticket, ready to go to heaven. No, no, the world to come, and he talks about they will be changed like the vesture, they'll be changed. And I heard the Holy Spirit say, that vesture that I'm changing is I'm changing the old wineskin and the old garment because you can't put a piece of new cloth into an old garment. You've got to change the thing. In other words, he's talking about a new covenant and a new way and new tongues and hallelujah, new every morning mercies. Come on, a new Jerusalem, a new creature, everything being made new. God's plan is behold, Revelation 21. Behold, got to calm myself down. I make all things new. And I love the message Bible. King James says, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. That's not that powerful. But I love how the message Bible says, it says, look, look, God has moved into the neighborhood. He made his home in men. Come on, touch your neighbor and say property values just went up. Because when God moves in the neighborhood, property values go up because God starts a major reformation program through the tabernacle of God that we are. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. God who at once, the heaven of heavens, was given to God, but the scripture says in Psalm, the earth he gave to the sons of men. It's our responsibility as stewards and watchmen of the planet to begin to bring change. It doesn't happen to the world. It doesn't happen through political power. It happens through the power of the Holy Ghost and through a people who start to realize their destiny and purpose and wake up to what they're called to do besides get saved and get your ticket and wait on some train to come get you to glory land. And when you die, you can go there and be happy. But it's about bringing what's happening in the heavens. That's why Jesus came in an earth suit because God knew the only way you can touch an earth is not through angels. You've got to do it through somebody with an earth suit. It's got to be a man. Hallelujah. Just like the first Adam and he was the last Adam. Am I making sense? Let me, let me get, get you a scripture here and then I'm going to try to get out your road tonight. Let's go to Nehemiah chapter 2 real quick. I hope this ministers to you tonight. Nehemiah, the second chapter, he's riding into city to see the condition of the city as they are beginning to leave Babylon. Chaos, walls are broken down, the temple's destroyed, the gates are burned with fire. It is absolute chaos. And here comes Nehemiah, the comforter, who, by the way, is the king's cupbearer. Hallelujah. He's the one that brings the cup of wine to the king. Hallelujah. How many of the Holy Ghost always comes to serve wine? Y'all help me a little bit. Come on. Hallelujah. How many of the Holy Ghost comes with the new wine of the Holy Spirit? He was the cupbearer. And so he could have been happy to just sit in the palace of the king and say, hey, I got a good job, man. I'm just, I'm cupbearer. I just need to get. How many of God moved him out of his safety zone because he was raising up some men like Ezra and Nehemiah put us out of our safety zone and lead reformation. Verse 11 says, So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. Then I arose in the night, I and a few men with me. I told no one what God, my God, had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem, nor was there any animal with me except the one on which I rode. I went out by night through the valley gate to the serpent well and to the refuse gate, viewed the walls of Jerusalem which were broken down and its gates which were burned with fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate into the king's pool when there was no room for the beast that was under me to pass. So I, went up in the, in, so I went up in the night by the valley and viewed the wall and turned back, entered the valley gate and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I had done. And I had not told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials or the others who did the work. Then I said to them, you see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste 
and its gates are, its gates are burned with fire. Come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. And I told them of the hand of my God which had been good upon me and also the king's words that he had spoken to me. So they said, let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to this good work. I really believe the word of the Lord for this season is, let us arise and build. I believe it's time to build. Now, I'm not talking about physical. I'm talking about we need to build relationships. We need to, first of all, learn how to pray in the Holy Ghost and build ourselves up on the most holy faith. We need to learn how to speak only that which is to the use of edification, that we can build each other up and edify each other. How many of we need to build bridges? Come on. The whole lot of stuff that's falling apart. We need to begin to arise and build families again. What I begin to see, even as they get on down in the building of this project, it, it would say, and the family of so-and-so built this section of the wall. And next unto him, the family of so-and-so built. And next unto him, the family of so-and-so built. And man, I heard the Lord say to me, get your family and get it on the wall. See, to me, in the Bible, walls speak of salvation and gates speak of praise. He said, your walls shall be called salvation and your gates shall be called praise. I believe the Lord is calling us to build our families and to build as families. One of the most powerful things you can do for the kingdom of God is get out of bed on Sunday morning and bring your kids to church. Now, that might seem like simple, but I'm going to tell you what, especially if you've got a church that's preaching something that's to the use of edification because I can tell you that's how this guy got where he's at is because somebody built a family. How I many of God always starts with a man and then a family and then a family that becomes a nation and a nation that becomes a kingdom? Are you seeing? See, we, we, we look at problem solving and we see the vast and bigness of it and we think, well, I have no idea how to solve any of these vast mega problems. And so we start looking somewhere else for an answer. And we forget to look right in front of me. What can I do to bring about reformation? I can start with my children and my grandchildren. You know, just again, uh, this is a conversation Stu and I had just a little while ago. We're sitting there having dinner together and I, I said, you know, as, uh, this year I hit 65. Whew. Don't know how I got here that fast. And, and so Stu and I were saying, you know, if something starts to hit you, when you start to get there, you think, dear Lord, that went by pretty quick. And you start thinking, the sand is running out of this hourglass. And you start thinking, when I was younger, I preached for popularity. But now I'm preaching for my posterity. Because I start to think, I want to leave a trail of truth that leaves something for my children and my grandchildren. If you looked at one of my recent Facebook posts, I posted a picture that my daughter-in-law posted of my three-year-old granddaughter. She's three now. We call her Ruru. Her real name's Marina Lynn. She's uh, about this tall. But she went to church last Sunday, and she decided she was going to dance, and she went up with the dance team, and she was, well, not the dance team. She went up to uh, and started. There's another little girl that's just a little bit bigger than her that dances and does the expression at dance. And this little granddaughter of mine was up there, and she was trying to imitate everything she saw the other one doing and I thought to myself that is how you change the world is you bring something into your children and your grandchildren because what I, I you know my son said to me the other day dad you know I don't know some of the stuff you preached in years past of the abuses of how religion stole your life he said I never thought I thought some of the stuff when you mimic that was just a joke and then I went to a church where they still preach like that and thought I've never I've never known that kind of bondage before. All I've ever known is the gospel of grace and the new covenant and the kingdom. And I've always believed that I had a future. And I've always believed that what you told me is that we are world changers. Are you hearing where I'm coming from? And, and when we start to pour that into a generation that follows us, the reason we've lost our young people is because we've stole their dreams and their life with religion. It was the thief of John 10. There's some other way. And it didn't give them life. It took their life. If the gospel doesn't give you back your life, it may not be the gospel at all. 
Somebody said, well, you're just a feel-good preacher. I said, that's why it's called the good news. And there is no bad news. Well, I'll try that over here. I said, the gospel is good news, and there is no bad news. No, yeah, but. Come on, hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah. To me, that's just incredible. Now, let me just, let me just stop. I need to get out your road here, but. In the midst of all this, he said, let's arise and build. I really believe that's where we are at in history right now in the American church and really all over the world. It's time to reform, it's time to change, and it's time to arise and build. It's time to revive stones out of heaps of rubbish. It's time to go back and begin to rethink some things that didn't work and go back and begin to rebuild, lay some stones on it. And God will raise up prophets like Zechariah Haggai, and you know what's incredible is? Zechariah comes on the scene and he says, who are you great mountain that stands before Zerubbabel? Who is this resistance? He said, but this mountain will be moved and the capstone and the cornerstone will be laid with shouts of grace, grace. Man, when I, I heard that, I thought there's only one other place in the scripture that talks about Grace, grace, a double enunciation of grace, and that's in John 1, where the real leader of the Reformation shows up, and he says, Moses gave you the law, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ, and of his fullness have all we received in grace for grace. That was the cornerstone. That's the capstone. It's turning everybody back to him with a message that says, grace, grace. When they came back from exile, they started singing, for the Lord is good, for his mercy endures forever. Can you see the shift? It's not doom and despair and agony on me. The sky is falling. It is grace, grace. You know what you preach manifests? You preach on suffering, people to suffer. Preach on devils, demons will show up. That's why I decided to preach favor because it shows up. Guess who else preached favor in the middle of chaos? Jesus shows up in the middle of Roman occupation, in the middle of great chaos, great persecution, and his first public message is, he sent me to declare the year of the favor of our God. And it sure didn't look like favor, come on. It looked like chaos everywhere to declare the year. And he closed the book and he said, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. Because sometimes favor don't always look like favor. It didn't look like favor for Joseph. When his father gave him a coat of many color, he ended up in prison. It didn't look like favor when God said to Mary, thou art highly favored. And the next day, everybody thinks she's an unwed, unwed mother. They're about to ostracize her. Her husband's about to put her away privately or her engaged one. It doesn't look like favor. Come on, somebody. So if it don't look like favor right now, don't get, don't get shook up. God's favor, hallelujah, is being declared in the midst of chaos because I believe we're in the midst of reformation and great change. And then he declares, Zechariah declares, return to me, you prisoners of hope. Because of the blood of your covenant, I'm going to return to you double for your trouble. Hallelujah. And then he starts to prophesy, speaking to that reformation, and he steps out of that reformation. He says, behold, your king comes to you riding on a colt, the foal of an ass. And that's the fulfillment of the prophecy that Jesus actually quotes when he rides into town on a donkey on Palm Sunday. And he says, you will find a colt tied and an ass at a door, at a place where two ways meet. I preached on Palm Sunday. Hallelujah. There's a donkey at the door. Hallelujah. He's at the door where two ways meet. The old covenant and the new couple. you got to decide which donkey you're going to take. If you're going to ride the old, stay back in the, where you were, or get on the new, there's a place where two ways meet. Your king comes riding. Come on. On a colt. He steps out of that and he says, what will you give me to buy me out of the covenant? And they weighed out for me 30 pieces of silver. In other words, everything was messianic and it pointed not just to that reformation, but to the bigger picture of reformation that we, I believe, are a part of who've decided to preach good news and grace and favor when it don't look like grace and favor. 
to preach new covenant realities and to begin to change the minds of people who have been locked into, I believe, Babylonian religion. It's time to arise and build. Hallelujah. And when he did, some few men started with him, but it began to relieve a reformation that ultimately brought them back where the temple was restored, the city was rebuilt, the walls were rebuilt, and the breaches were shut up, and God had brought them to reformation. Come on, stand on your feet all over this building tonight. Hallelujah. I really feel like, hallelujah, that we are in a season. I hope this ministered to you tonight. I just, if nothing else, at least see beyond the immediate circumstances of what we think is happening in the earth. Because I know that it's, I know I'm swimming against the tide when I'm talking about bringing change, when everybody's talking about this is about over, it's about wrap up, you know, it's going to get worse and yada, yada. Read a book recently called Why You've Been Duped Into Thinking the World is Getting Worse. And statistically, this guy who had been a news reporter was showing statistics how the world has not gotten worse, but it's actually gotten better. I know y'all going to look at me funny for a moment, but we're the first generation that really has lived we're one of the first generations to live long enough to die from cancer. I know that don't sound like good news, but just a few decades ago, the life expectancy of the American male was 57 years old. My mother-in-law just turned 90 last month. Hallelujah. Had a friend that passed away last year. was 103 and a half. Still, well, still wore makeup and high heels. Went to South Africa when she was 100, preached the gospel. Come on, somebody, that's some good news right there. But he said he was a news anchor, and he said, here's what our philosophy was. If it bleeds, it leads. If it's bad news, it'll sell. And so when we sat and watched that, hour after hour, day after day, we get this mentality that makes me think my world is really bad. And I'm not trying to pretend like there's not some very real problems in our world. I'm just trying to get somebody to wake up and say, if things have gotten better statistically over the last couple hundred years with bad theology, what would happen if we preached a theology that says we're here for a purpose and we're here to bring change? If the church would engage to bring change, And I think tonight, as I bring this to a close, I, you just have to ask yourself, Lord, can I arise and build? Arise and build something in me first. Hallelujah. Would you receive it if I just declare favor over you tonight? Hallelujah. Come on, just lift your hands all over this room for a moment. Let me just pray. Hallelujah. Because I believe God wants to give favor. You know, while everything can seem like it's, it's bad, I, I think this is a day of opportunity. This, this is a day of, uh, there are jobs everywhere. If you, want, if you wanted to better yourself right now, man, there are, there are jobs everywhere that are begging people to come. And some setbacks say, well, this is the wealth of the wicked laid up for the sinner and think it's the wealth of the wicked because they get a, an unemployment check. And I'm not, I'm not opposed to unemployment. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying, but don't think that's the wealth transfer. It's while in the midst of that, that guy won't go get a job. You've got jobs and opportunities here that you could change your world for a long term and better some things. In other words, what I'm simply saying is there are opportunities that are abound that in the midst of bad situations, God can turn some things that were meant for evil for good because I believe the Holy Spirit is hovering over chaos. So Lord, I declare over them favor. I declare favor right now. Lord, I declare that we're sons of God without rebuke before a cricket and perverse generation. I pray, God, that you give innovative ideas, business strategies. Hallelujah. Lord, that you will give strategies to, uh, to, to, to bridge and build bridges and to build relationships and to build our families. I pray that you restore 
Hallelujah. As we revive stones out of the heaps of rubbish, that we begin to arise and build, that we declare, return to me, you prisoners of hope, that we are irrevocably and unapologetically a prisoner of hope because we know a God that's big enough. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To restore and to rebuild. I pray that there is a great awakening across our country and across the world, not just for revival, but for reformation. And Lord, in the midst of that, yes, I, 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 I have absolutely no criticism for anybody leading revival, but when the revival is over, let it be about something besides a cold chill or a jerk or a goosebump, but let it be something that transforms our lives, our families, our cultures, our government, hallelujah, our world, hallelujah, because the world to come was not put in subjection to angels, but the sons and daughters of the living God, hallelujah. So thank you, Lord, that you're equipping saints everywhere for that work of service, hallelujah. Let them not become discouraged by the discouraging words of Sanballat and Tobiah to try to stop them from building and let them respond by saying, I'm doing a great work. I cannot come down. I have received a letter from the other side of the river. Hallelujah. And I have a mandate to build. In Jesus' name. Amen.